Amen. the NIV version. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. All, it is my desire to be a reflection of Christ in all that I do. You may be seated, may the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his most precious and holy word. Good morning, let us pray together. Dear Lord Father, we come today just to say thank you for all the things that you've done for us and just for your greatness. No matter what happens, we know that we can turn to you and the answer is as long as we come in thy word and in thy name and in thy, thy will, we know that we have what we ask. And this is the confidence that we have in you that if we ask in thy name, that we will get what we need. We ask you to uh, bless the ones that are sick today. Watch over them. Give them your strength. Keep them in your spirit. Watch over them day after day and let them know. Send them loved ones to comfort them or whatever they need in this time of need. We ask you to bless this nation and watch over the nation. We have uh, many things going on. We still have hunger. We still have disease. And we ask you uh, to comfort us and to uh, help us along the way in these things. We ask you to watch over the churches today, to keep them and watch them. We ask that you visit the churches today in your spirit and keep us in your spirit. Someone here today may need to be touched by your spirit. We ask you to sin and love as you normally do. We thank you. And we ask you to bless the pastor today. We ask you to bless all pastors today. And that they send word out that may send someone to you in, um, in, to save their life. And lastly, Lord, we ask you to we, uh, help us in our daily lives as you always do. We don't always go and come as we should. But we know that we have you to guide us. And we can always come back. And we ask you to send to let someone know today that no matter what state they're in, illness, uh, physically or spiritually, uh, it's not too late. That you are, your kindness uh, extends beyond the world here, beyond the earth. And we thank you, and in Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, Ebenezer. Praise the Lord, Ebenezer. Come on and stand up on your feet. We're getting ready to praise God this morning. Has God been good to anybody? Come on, put your hands together. Oh, I love Jesus. He's my Savior. When the storms are raging, He is my shelter. Where He lives. Follow. I love Jesus. He loves me. Come on to heaven and say, I love, I love Jesus. Jesus. He's my Savior. He's my Savior. When the storms, when the storms are raging, raging. He's, my He's my shelter. Where he leads me, I will, I will follow. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Come on. He loves One me. more time. Jesus, he, he's my Savior. When the, when the songs are raging, 
He's my shelter. Wherever he leads me, I will. I love Jesus. He loves me. Yeah. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. And I won't take it back. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. And I won't take it back. first-time guest in the sanctuary to stand at this time. All right, everyone. Ebenezer, we're being blessed with guests. We would like to thank you for worshiping with Ebenezer this morning. We hope that something will be said or done to make your time of worship at the Ebenezer Baptist Church a spiritual-filled blessing. We ask that you do return and worship with us again and bring someone the next time, cousin, friend, co-worker, tell them to come on and worship with us. Our Ebenezer church doors are always open. And if you're looking for a church home, we will take you gladly. Please come worship with us again. You may be seated to my Ebenezer church family. I love each and every one of you. And remember, if anybody in this sanctuary is going through any hard times, 
or anything at this time. Just remember, this too shall pass. And God is on your side. I love y'all. Be blessed. Have a blessed day and week. Brother Cam works on that. It is certainly good to see each and every one of you on this, our Lord's morning. Amen. Is Sister Stripling, is she anywhere around here? Amen. She may be here shortly, and she will uh, tell us uh, what we need to know as it relates to our uh, graduating seniors and college students. But I do want to ask that the church would be in prayer for the Underwood family. Brother Caleb Underwood, his sister-in-law, went home to be with the Lord earlier this week. Um, I believe he is somewhere. Where are you? Amen. And his, his niece is here also, the daughter um, of his sister-in-law. So we're certainly praying for you and your family as a whole. Uh, in addition, I believe they had three other passings uh, this week, and we are praying for you as a family. Amen. We, um, you know, we don't know what people are going through. Um, we are quick to sometimes not be so very kind or not be so very nice, um, but you never know what folks are going through. Pray also for uh, Brother Sister Cubitt. Um, Brother Cubitt's uh, sister's homegoing service was yesterday, uh, and they did uh, make that journey. And I do, again, want to publicly say, uh, please forgive us as a church for not getting the resolution there uh, with you and with your family. Uh, those things, they mean a lot to, to us in our culture, and we certainly want to ask that you would forgive us uh, for failing to do that. Amen? Also, um, Brother Jimmy Jones, he is asking that the men would prepare themselves, um, and we'll send out a message uh, as to what date that it will be, but prepare yourself to sing. Amen. Next Sunday, all of our men, uh, we want to sing on Mother's Day. And we also want to invite uh, not just you as mothers, but bring uh, your mother here and worship the Lord uh, here at the Ebenezer Church. Um, as you see on the printed program, we were going to have baptisms right about now. Amen. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to move it to the end of service. As uh, we went up and looked, a lot of the water had uh, come out of the pool, and we could have easily gotten enough back in to uh, get them baptized here in a few moments. But when I thought about the fact that our water heater went out a few days ago and I tried to get in the shower without it, I thought I wouldn't want to do to somebody else what I, wouldn't, what I didn't want done to me, <laughs> and that's to be in cold water. Uh, so we're going to let a little bit more water get in, and then we're gonna, that heater will get that uh, warmed up. Uh, let me just say it like this. It'll, it'll knock the cold off of it. Amen. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to wait until the, uh, the end of the service uh, to baptize uh, these who have uh, come forth and wanted to follow the Lord in a believer's baptism. Um, momentarily, I believe right after the altar prayer, our children will assemble in the back for Children's Church. So if you are a guest with us today, just know that your child will be in able and capable teacher's hands uh, during that time and they can follow uh, these that will go uh, to the back. I believe that's all that I have. We're going to ask that our deacons, that our trustees will come as we prepare to worship the Lord with our giving. Um, as we typically say here at Ebenezer, if you are a guest here with us, we are certainly not compelling or asking you to give. Uh, this is certainly for our Ebenezer church family. This church is supported by the tithe and offerings of its church members. Um, the things that we do outside of this church, uh, some of that is supported by uh, the offerings of the members here, and some are supported by people like yourself who are here uh, just as a guest and others. 
So feel free if you desire to give, but you certainly uh, do not have to give. And I assure you the lights will be on next week. Amen. Uh, amen. <laughs> We're going to ask that Reverend Keith Boyce would prepare to lead us during the altar prayer time. And whenever he comes forward, we would just ask if four, five, six, maybe seven would assemble themselves right here. We still uh, want to be uh, take precautionary measures. We know, uh, as I say often, that uh, many of us in the culture, uh, many in the culture, they're finished with COVID, but COVID is certainly not finished with us just yet. All right. Good morning. Good morning once again. At this time, we, we're going to uh, have our offering, and as we do here at our church, we have a motto, Then after that, I will be turning it over to the, to the ushers. Repeat after me. Remember the words of Lord Jesus. Remember the words of Lord Jesus. How he said, said it's more blessed to give, blessed to give than, to receive. than to receive. Amen. And we are also going to take up an offering. Uh, there will be a separate offering for our children uh, relating to those, uh, our young adults that are in college and those that will be graduating in the month of May. So will you give towards uh, that? Do we have a separate basket? There we go. Deacon Ransom will be holding that basket. All right, let us worship the Lord. Let us stand. Get this section, please stand facing this outside wall and start it from the rear, please. This section here. Can I get this section, please stand facing that outside wall and start it from the rear, please? This middle section, stand, please start from the rear, please. This middle section, facing this inside out, and start from the rear. Can I get this section to please stand, facing that outside out, and start from the rear, please? This section here.
shall we pray? Watch out, Marcus. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Father. Asking your blessings upon this Ebenezer Baptist Church, Father. Father, we ask you to touch each and every individual sitting in the pews this morning, Father. Father, we ask you to touch those bereaved families, Father. You know who they are, Father. Our sick and our shed in, Father. Let them know that you are the way and that you are the light. And then, Father, we ask a special blessing upon the man who's going to bring the bread of life this morning. That we will look up and see you, Father, and not him. And once again, Father, we just ask a special blessing upon the children of Ebenezer. We ask a special blessing upon our uh, uh, visitors this morning, Father. And once again, Father, we just ask you to bless us as a whole, Father. And all these things we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. You know the verse, too. I love you, Jesus. I lift my hands and turn around. Yeah. And use that at. <laughs>
again. Come on, do it for me again. Again. I know I just asked you yesterday, but I need you to do it again. Again. Do it for me again. Again.
passing by. Oh, yes, he did. Oh, yeah. He said, lay your hand. Lord, lay your hand. Lay your hands on me. The man cried, oh, yeah. Lord, do it. Lord, Lord do, it. do it. I need a touch from you right now. How many of you need the Lord to do it? How many really need the Lord to do it? I dare you to say, do it for me. Right now. Anybody want God? Come on, say, do it for me. Have it to do. Do it for me. I don't see you singing right here. Right. some praise in this house. Oh, we can do better than that. I don't see some of y'all clapping right now. Don't want to give God some praise in this house. How many know he's worthy? How many know he is worthy? Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. As we come up to a point in our service, this is altar prayer and the pastor's already given instructions. But come down all ye that are heavy laden, about six or seven, heavy burden. We are still COVID conscious, amen. Hallelujah. How many really love Jesus? Listen, sometimes you're gonna mess up when you love Jesus. Anybody know that? We're not always, always perfect, but that don't mean I love him. I've intentionally sinned, but I still love him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just help me sing a little bit of this. I lift my hands in total adoration to you. You reign. Help me sing. You reign on the throne for you are God and God and alone because, because of you, my clown, oh, 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 I can sing to you this song. I just want to say that I love you. Anybody love him today? Come on, Harmon, let's take him to the chorus. Everybody sing in concert and say, I love you, Jesus. Come on, help me sing, I love I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Hallelujah. I worship and adore you. Just want to 
whoa, 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 I just wanna, whoa, 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 As we bow, Father God, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for this day, oh God. We just thank you because you are God all by yourself, and above you there is none other. So God, before we have the nerve to ask for one thin dime, we just want to say thank you. Come on, somebody shout out, thank you, Lord. You've been so good to us. You kept us from danger, seen and unseen dangers, God. You kept all of the, all the traps and the snares out of our way, God. And we just say thank you. We thank you because we know that you are our shepherd, God. In the name of Jesus. Now, God, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us right now, God. Wash us and make us whole. God, in the name of Jesus, you said in your word that whatever we bind on earth is bound in earth. And whatever we loose on earth is loose in heaven. So we bind the enemy up right now in the name of Jesus. God, loose your Holy Ghost up on this place like never before, God. We want to have church today in the name of Jesus. We're praying for every sick and shut-in person right now. God, run through nursing homes, run through emergency rooms, run through hospitals, God, and heal as long as you can. God, we're praying for our body, for the body of Ebenezer Baptist Church that is sick right now. We pray, God, that you restore them back in the name of Jesus to 100%. We pray for our bereaved brothers and sisters that you comfort them and carry them. But God, most of all, we pray for our pastor right now. In the name of Jesus, God, we pray that you give him a rhema word that we can use today, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray for his wife and his family. And God, we pray for each and every person under the sound of my voice individually as well as collectively. God, we'll be so careful to give your name all the honor and all the glory and all the praise that is due none other to you in the mighty matchless, miraculous, marvelous, miracle-working name of Jesus Christ. Now loose those hands and say amen. And come on, somebody, put your hands together and Lord, give God a praise. I love, Lord, I love you more than anything. Go on, I love you, Jesus, I love, I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. I worship and adore. Just wanna tell you, I see your praise back there. I'm gonna wait for you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you more than anything. If y'all can sing with us, Amazing Grace as a hymn of preparation. If you don't mind, stand with me one more time. Amazing grace How sweet the sound that to the only wise God. Father, we thank you for this day, this day that you have given unto us, which is a blessed day in you. Father, I ask now that you would anoint me for preaching. And Father, just let the words of my mouth and the very meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. For truly, O oh Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. 
So in the blessed name of Jesus, we do offer this prayer. Let the people of God say, Amen. If you would turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Certainly want to thank um, Reverend Herman Richmond, Reverend Keith Boyce, and our entire uh, Ebenezer Ensemble. Uh, certainly they uh, bless my heart on today. I would ask that the church would continue to lift up in prayer Minister Pinky Boston. Uh, I was by to see her just briefly a few days ago, and, and uh, she is still Sister Boston. Amen. She is certainly an encouragement. She encouraged my heart just for the moments that I spent with her. Pray for her. Pray for the entire family as a whole. Again, Reverend Richmond, thank you so much. And, and he knows how much I like that fourth stanza of when we've been there 10,000 years. So he wanted to make sure he got it in, and I'm grateful. Uh, I just figured we might go on in prayer. But thank you, Reverend. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, commence reading at verse number 16. If we would remain standing for the reading of God's word. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You may be seated. Amen. Reverend Sanchez, would you come on up here with us, please? Amen. Just for a little while today, as we look at, really focus our attention uh, on verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Just for a little while today, I want to talk from this subject and certainly try to encourage us all and say you can have a new start. You can have a new start. All of us have reached points in our lives that we desire a new start. Maybe it was a divorce that when you look back on it, you wish that you would have left him or her down at the altar and took your best friend on the honeymoon. I don't know what may have gone on in your, in your marriage, in your subsequent divorce, but, but many go through these times and they desire a new start. Uh, I don't know, maybe there was a job loss and ultimately led to you losing your home or our bankruptcy. I, I want to say to you, you can have a new start. Maybe it was a shattered friendship, a person that you shared your deepest, darkest, most intimate secrets with, and they uh, stabbed you in your back. They betrayed you, and the, the relationship, the friendship is shattered. I do want to tell you, you can have a new start. Maybe it was the loss of a positive reputation. You do know that we live in a time that none of us are perfect. There will be some ebbs and flows. There certainly will be some ups and some downs. But even if you have lost your reputation, I want you to know that you can have a new start. Maybe you were not the father or the mother that you should have been when your children were growing up. But you can have a new start in Jesus Christ. I don't know, maybe you are a farmer uh, addict, drug addict, or alcoholic, or even gang member, gang banger. I, I'm here to tell you, you can have a new start 
in Jesus Christ. Brother Ben, it's good to see you over there. But, but, but 2 Corinthians, uh, it was written by the Apostle Paul to a church in Corinth, Greece. The Corinthian church, it was really one of the most messed up churches of all history. They, they are very much the kind of church that many today, they would warn a loved one and say that you need to steer clear from that church. But sin abounded in this cosmopolitan city of Corinth. They were intrigued by Greek philosophy. They were captivated by the discipline training and the athletic events. And at one time, this, this city, it was the home to at least 12 pagan temples. They had worship ceremonies carried out by a thousand temple prostitutes who were connected with the temple of Aphrodite, which was the goddess of love. This behavior, uh, uh, it bred blatantly throughout the entire city of Corinth. Uh, prostitutes, they openly plied their wares and, and, and meat markets. They thrived on the sales from the sacrifices that were offered in the temple. This was a horrible place. Uh, the Corinthians, they, they ate well. They satisfied their sexual urges without condemnation. They flirted with the wisdom of men, and they did all that they could do to keep their bodies as beautiful as the Greek gods that they saw. They loved to listen to great orators. The population of this city was some 700,000 people. And Sister Denise, 500,000 of those 700,000 were slaves. But Paul, he loved this church. The people, they had become very near and dear to his heart. And although many in the Corinthian assembly, they had gone astray and almost the entire body was infected, Paul, he loved this church. Paul, the holy apostle, the instrument of the Holy Spirit, the person whose testimony this church, it stood or it fell on, uh, he does something that many of us would not do. Uh, if, if it were the church folks of today, uh, you would immediately look to separate yourself from those kind of folks if we had the authority, we would cast them out of uh, Jesus Christ, his kingdom. We would call down lightning bolts from heaven to destroy them. But Paul, he does nothing of the sort. He even recognizes and proclaims uh, them to be the church of Christ and the communion of the saints. Uh, in, in, in Paul's opening letter. I don't know what that is. Amen. Somebody help me. In Paul's opening letter to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2, this is what he said. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who were in every place, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. He says, grace to you and peace from our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is how Paul spoke to these, uh, what we would deem as God-awful people. But God, uh, God, he spoke to Paul, and Paul had it in his heart that he wanted to get this church in the right manner. He, he wanted to help this church, to encourage this church, and he wanted this church to get it right. Any true man or woman of God, they want the church to be right. They don't want the church to just be raggedy and doing anything. But, but he was going to have to convince them that, that they are better than this. They're better than the way they are behaving. And I need to tell some brother or sister here this morning that you're better than the way you're acting. <clears throat> You're a better man than you're behaving when you cuss your wife out in front of your lawns, the children of your lawns, and, and you storm out of the house on your way to another woman's house in order for you to release some pent-up frustration. You, brother, are better 
than that. Young sister, you're better. You're a better woman than the way you act. When you go on a drunken spree mixed with a weed high that's trying to drown out the pain of your past, past abortion, past pain from an absent father, past uh, pain from your ex walking down the aisle with another Pain from an ongoing affair with a man that ain't never leaving his home, never, no matter how much he tells you that he is. Pain from implicitly selling your soul and your body to a man that you know that you will never be with, but he helps you raise your kids. Sister, you're better than that. You're a better Christian than to have been out of church for as long as you've been out of church. You know, you know who I'm talking to. You know in your own heart who you are. You've been out of church for some time now, but you still say you are a Christian, and you are a Christian, but you are better than that than to be out of church for as long as you have. But Paul, he points uh, this Corinthian church back to a new beginning. Now, I've tried to paint the picture for you that this, it was an awful church. This, this, this assembly of the Corinthians, I mean, they were some bad actors. And when we look at verse number 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, is not just speaking to the one who uh, just got born again and now uh, is saying that you are now a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, meaning that every little thing is going to be gone and your life is going to be perfect. That's not really what the text is trying to tell us. What the text is trying to tell us is that Paul is speaking to folks who have been born again at a time and now they are living raggedy, Sister Ransom. So Paul is doing it a little different than the way we do it. You know, we like to holler, cuss, and fuss and tell people how horrible they are and what they should be doing and all that. Paul is speaking to them in a little bit different manner. He's reminding them. He's pointing them back to a new beginning. So, so today, I, I really want to uh, encourage us and point us back to a new beginning. Now, if you have never trusted Christ as Savior, then your new beginning can be today. Your new beginning was not last week, last month, last year, last decade. But, but if you have been born again already, and, and you're not living in the right manner, then I'm trying to point us back to a new beginning. And, and, unless you get it twisted, I, I'm not just pointing the finger at you, because I got three of them pointing back at my doggone self. So I'm trying to encourage all of us and point us to a new beginning. But, but the question really is, Sister LaDonna, is uh, what happens when we become a Christian? What, what changes in our lives? The short answer is everything changes. That, that's the short answer. The gospel is not just to save us and then one day we're teleported to heaven. That's not, that's not the gospel. I mean, that's one of the reasons for us to go to heaven. But, but, but the gospel is to transform us right here, right now. That, that our lives would be different. That we would be more loving. We would be more kind. We would be more patient. We would be more long-suffering. But the short answer is it changes everything. But specifically, uh, Sister Tiffany, it, it comes down to relationships. A changed relationship with God, it, 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 will, it will transform itself. It will lead itself to a changed relationship with the world. So it's, okay, it's not just a changed relationship with God. But it's a changed relationship with mankind. 
It's a changed relationship with God. But then it's a changed relationship that symbolizes the cross. It's a changed relationship with the world. When you follow Jesus, you're going to look at everything differently. Uh, So often we we talk about how, Brother Brent, how awful this uh, world is and, and it needs to change. But if we really want the world to change, then it starts with our perspective of others. Uh, Verse number 16, Deacon Parker says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. The New Living Translation says, uh, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. We stopped evaluating with some mighty horrible evaluators. I was about to say mighty good evaluators. We think we're good evaluators, but really we're horrible evaluators. But it says stop. Uh, we, we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. Can I say to us, the cover of the book won't help you. It's what's inside of the book that you need to focus on. Uh, You know, that's just another way we say you can't judge a book by its cover. I'm saying the cover of the book, it won't help you. But but, but it's what's on the inside of the book uh, that that you need to focus on. A, A pretty book cover filled with mindless thoughts or things that are no good for The soul won't help you. No, no. You can have a beautiful covered book. That's why when you're in the grocery store and you're walking, uh, getting ready to go through the checkout lane, they have all of those magazine covers. Y'all know the kind of magazine covers I'm talking about. They have all the magazine covers uh, with uh, what the world deems as something beautiful on the outside, but there's nothing good. To speak of on the inside. Um, Brother, uh, a woman shaped like a brick house with a pretty face and a little waist. Is that what y'all say? With no moral fiber or character will do you nothing but harm, my brother. Sister. A man built like a Greek god with looks of Denzel and has a soul uh, that's uh, uh, blacker than the darkest night will cause you nothing but grief the rest of your natural born life. But the cover of the book won't help you. It's what's inside of the book that you need to focus on. What, what, what Paul is saying is, is that before he was converted, he viewed things, including the Lord Jesus, from a human perspective. He, pay, he paid no attention um, to the things that really mattered, but he was paying attention to the outward things uh, like his family, Jesus' education, his position, uh, his popularity, and the things that he said and did, and the chronicle records of his actions and performance. But, but Paul is saying following his conversion, his perception and perspective of Jesus Christ uh, drastically changed. Before I was saved, I viewed Jesus in one way. I viewed him as a, quote unquote, as a prophet. Uh, but, but when I got saved, I realized that he was and is so much more than that. But, 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 but our perception and perspective of others should change also. Paul, he no longer gained his evaluation of man by outward appearances. He no longer valued uh, the externals of the flesh that are so highly prized in this world that we live in today. But since being saved, Paul, he preferred to evaluate 
a man by his inner character, a man, a woman, boy, a girl, and by their new position in Christ Jesus. For Paul knew that if any man be in Christ, they have a, a, a new creation. Uh, the old fleshly nature, the sensual man is done away with and must remain nailed to the cross for all things have become new in Jesus Christ. Paul, he learned that the intent of the fallen sin nature of man is unreliable. Uh, the, the, the fallen sin nature of man, Sister Carnita, is, is unreliable. As, as much as we uh, try to do the right thing, and, and, and when we would to do good, evil is always present. When we want to do what's right, uh, the, 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 the old nature, uh, the fallen sin nature of man is unreliable. That's why when you say, I'm not going to do this, that, or the other, uh, sometimes you turn around and you do just what you said that you wouldn't do. You know why? Because this... Uh, unreliable uh, fallen sin nature it's selfish a a and Paul determined to neither recognize uh, nor regard any person from an outward human viewpoint meaning that if you know that your uh, fallen sin nature if you know that it's unreliable can I get a witness today do you know that your sin nature, your fallen sin nature is unreliable when you have in your mind or heart that certain things that you won't do, but you turn around and do them anyway? My question is, if you know that about yourself, then why don't you know that about others? That, that others... They, I mean, they're going to make the same mistakes you make. Sister Brittany, it might not be the exact same mistake, but you got to be very careful because you, the Bible says, when a man is overtaken in a fall, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. In the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So, so it's not saying that the same thing that that person fell into that you're going to fall into, uh, but you need to consider yourself. And that word consider in the Greek is the word scopio that we get our English word scope from. So what Paul is saying, don't turn the gun and the scope uh, and point it at Sister Ransom, but turn that sucker right to yourself because you liable to fall too. I can't get no help today. But, 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 but Paul made the decision from that time forward, he would not regard men from any worldly standards. Even though he admitted that at one time he regarded Christ according to the flesh, even though he had known Christ from a human point of view, no longer would he do so now. Christ was now the risen, the ascended, and the glorified Lord of glory, whose personal ministry on earth uh, had been now superseded by the ministry of reconciliation, whereby every member of his body is a full and a free participant. So like Paul, we must now also make sure that from now on, Deacon Wright, that our assessment of others is not according to the flesh. You do know that you wrestle not against flesh and blood, don't you? I wish I had a Bible reader on today. And our perspective of Christ must not only be as a historical figure, but now as a crucified, risen, ascended, and glorified Lord of glory, who now is seated at the right hand of, of the throne of God. And he is now our God and he is our Savior who laid down his life that we may live. So if a man or woman, I, I, let me say it like this, Cynthia, uh, when a man or woman comes to faith in Christ, regardless of their past, who are we to bring their past up? I 
don't know. You know, m- most often, um, instead of us being excited and, and full of, of joy, when a former unbeliever comes to faith in Christ, the first thing that we want to do is talk about what they used to do. I, 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 I knew them when. I, I, I knew them when they used to go down to the master's club and gamble. I, I, I knew them when they used to go to the shape of I, I, I knew them when they used to be at the Odyssey every weekend. I ain't necessarily talking about myself. Uh, I knew them when they used to go to the country club, not where they played golf, but where they gambled all night long. I knew them when they would be at the crack house. I knew I used to see so-and-so go up the steps of his house uh, every single night. I remember, I remember, I remember. Can I ask you this? What do you think folks remember about you? Let me say it the way I want to. Hell, y'all think y'all think y'all the only one with a memory? You think you think folks they have amnesia as it relates to your life? Y'all don't want to hear me. Sister, Sister Payne, Sister Payne, we'll, we'll, we'll let them hold up. We're going to give them time. We're going to give them time. They, they need to hear this message. Amen. Let them sit down. Amen. We're going to give them time. Amen. But, 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 but Paul is saying that, that, that we have to be careful with that. Because when when someone comes to faith in Christ and and we want to talk about all the things that they used to do, uh, 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 we are often sadly mistaken about what they used to do. They didn't hear me. It went right over their head. Often the things that you're talking about that folks used to do is some type of folklore that has been uh, has evolved over time. But Paul, he said this in Ephesians chapter two, beginning with verse one, he said, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, and among, uh, verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversations in times past, in the lust of the flesh, not just the lust of the flesh, but fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Now, now you understand he, he, what he's saying here. The, the lust of our flesh, but fulfilling the desires, not just thinking about it. He's saying doing it, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 3, he said, we all had our conversations in times past. Can can I say it the way I want to? Maybe your conversation wasn't as public as somebody else's conversation. But but the conversation, Brother Brent, is saying that, that in time past, all of us have done some foolishness. And again, maybe yours was not as public. Maybe yours wasn't on the front page of the Oklahoma. Maybe yours wasn't all over Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok, and everywhere else. But but all. But then he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 9, he says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither uh, the sexually uh, Im- immoral, nor idolatrous, nor adulterous. I want you to listen to every one of them right through here. Not just one. Don't focus on just one. Uh, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And look what he says in verse number 11. And such were some They want me to quit. No, no. Let me tell you what they're saying, Reverend. They're saying, preacher, just go on and get them baptisms done and communion because I, I don't want to hear no more. This, this is hard preaching. 
but this is the preaching that's going to help us. I didn't say y'all, uh, us, all of us. But and such were some of you. But we can't just leave it there. Because the B clause of verse 11 says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So justified just as if you never sinned. But we, we, must, uh, we must change the way we look at others. Uh, and then we must change the way we look at ourselves. Because we really have kind of two groups of people often. One group is the one who is too hard on everybody else. Just too hard on everybody else. But then the second group that I know I'm in is we're too hard on ourselves. So not only do we change the way we look at others, but we also change the way you look at yourself. These, these two um, points, they really kind of go hand in hand. The truth is that we often, uh, so often, look at ourselves through the lens of the world's values. You, you got to quit looking at yourself through the lens of, um, of, of the ground. And, and Facebook, you, you got to quit, you got to quit, that, that's, a, that's a false optic. You got to quit looking at yourself. <laughs> now, I'm sure I'm the only person. I'm sure I'm the only person. Let me tell you why I know that that optic through all of that, you know, all the social media platforms is not a, a real optic. Because I know I'm the only person, Reverend Sanchez. Because when you look at people and you see them on the social media platform, I mean, Sister Ransom, everybody's beautiful and handsome. until you see them live and in living color. Now, now I, I'm not trying to be, I'm not, I, honestly, I'm not trying to be funny. So let me, let, me, let me bring the point home of what I'm really trying to say. So if we know, we know that's true, that that's not the way people really look. Okay. You can't walk around with a filter in front of you. You're not, you know, in the Superman uh, movies, you know, where you can put some shield over you to put a, you know, no, you can't do that. So, so if we know that's true, then let me tell you what's also true. You know, when you look and you see somebody with a shiny, nice car, you don't know how many payments they're behind. You, you see the house in the backdrop. You don't know who's on the, the mortgage, the title deed, and, and you, I mean, you don't know. But let me say this. For those of you who are saying, but preacher, yeah, no, 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 they, you know, some of them, they got the bag. They really got the bag. But you don't know what, what, what type of hell they got going on in their life. So, so you can, don't, you got to change the way you look at yourself. You, you cannot look at yourself through that lens, through that optic so if, if we think of, of others as something because they, they have some, what do y'all say? Yeah, coins. What they say, Brent? What they say nowadays? You, you as old as I am now, Brent. But, 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 but if, we, if, we, if we look at them and view them as something because they have money, or, or they have power, or influence, or, or, or popularity, then we will often... Uh, establish our own value by the same standards. Now those are false standards. They, they really are. Because you don't really know what's happening with somebody else. But it really don't matter what's happening with somebody else. You really kind of need to focus on yourself. But, but when you change the way that you look at others, the question is what basis is left on which you are to measure yourself? 
if you're not, if you're not looking at others in a particular way, then, then how do you, what basis are you going to look at yourself? What measuring stick are you going to use to look at yourself? I'm glad you asked the question. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You know what I, what I love about this uh, verse, Brother Mitchell, is that in this verse we find encouragement. We find encouragement. And we also find re rebuke. And encouragement that a new beginning, Brother Plunkett, is, is possible, but a rebuke in light of the fact that we have had a new beginning and you ought to be growing up. But change the way you look at yourself. We are all born into sin, and we are sinful from the beginning. I know we look at the little baby, and we think that the little baby is just so very innocent. But no, the little baby is, is, is a, fallen, so a fallen creature, creation, and that's when you spank the baby, and the baby, you hit the baby, the doctor, what, one time, and the baby's going to do what? Cry. Sin. Fallen nature. All of us from the very beginning. So at some point in our lives, a change must take place, whereas we go from being outside of Christ to in Christ. The theological term here is one of regeneration. I, I mentioned it a moment ago. Regeneration is really uh, the act in which God declares the guilty sinner uh, uh, r righteous. Uh, but regeneration, we go from being dead to alive. I'm sorry, I said justification a moment ago. The act in which God declares the guilty sinner righteous. But regeneration, Pastor Pryor would always say it like this, regeneration is like we have been regened. Regeneration, we go from being dead to alive. Look, look, look with me, Titus chapter 3 verse 5. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Listen, it ain't nothing you've done in and of yourself to get saved. You believed. It's not about some action. It's about you trusting Jesus in your own heart, believing Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and bodily resurrected on the third day morning. But, but the washing of the regeneration by the renewal of the Spirit. The question is, how did this happen? 2 Corinthians 5.18 said, all of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is an important point of view in the Christian's life. Uh, can I tell you that Jesus did not come to make bad people good? And he didn't even come to take care of good people. But Jesus came to make dead people alive. And when we change the way we look at ourselves, we see that we are either dead or we are alive. We are either dead or we are in Christ. There's no other way to look at it. But that doesn't mean that we are immediately perfect either. But the problem is that many of us, when we come alive, we still stink like death. I think about the story in uh, John chapter 11, verse 38 and following. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself, coming to the grave, it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, take ye the stone away. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he had been dead four days. He stinketh. So as a new creation, when you come alive, you will still stinketh. That's how I said it, like I wanted to say it. But at least you are alive. And then you take a bath uh, every day for the rest of your life. This is called sanctification, a process by which our stink goes away and we become more and more like Jesus Christ. But we can't expect ourselves or anyone else to have it all together day one. You didn't have it all together day one. 
day 100, 1,000, 10,000. And many of you uh, come in here Sunday to Sunday. You come in here stinking. You get up in this pulpit stinking. You, you, you get in the choir and you uh, sing like an angel, stinking. Uh, you sit in the pews or in the seats uh, and you think you have uh, this uh, audacity to think that your manure is the only one that don't stink. You stinketh. But I have good news for you today. God loves your stinky self and I'm sure trying to. But change, really change the way you look at others. Change the way you look at yourself. But change the way you look at your purpose. We are, Deacon Ransom, living in this day and time where so many people are concerned about making an impact, making a difference, living on purpose, living on point. They, they want their lives to mean something. And, and, and I understand that. Uh, but this goes hand in hand with the way that we look at ourselves and look at others. If wealth is the measure of success, then my, my purpose will be tied to money. And money has a way, uh, Samare, of uh, it's going to either leave you or you going to leave it one or the other. But, but, but that's going to be the focal point to, to get uh, some money, to get the bag. If it's, uh, if it's to have a great family, a meaningful career, a, 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 a cause to fight for, good grades, whatever, that's going to become our purpose. But Paul suggests that for this new creation in Christ, having been reconciled by God through Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, there is an even greater purpose. We have been given a greater purpose. You know what it is, Sister Wallace? We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation, that in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, that others can be reconciled to God. The message of reconciliation. The next time somebody try to tell me uh, on the open mic talk show or on they subliminal remarks on social media about who, because um, listen, I ain't allowing, this ain't my church. This is the Lord Jesus' church. So whoever want to come to this church is welcome to come to this church. But the next time that, that I see something, I hear about something as it relates to when Governor Stitt or Congresswoman Bice or our white folks come and, and get food and, and other items, the next time I'm going to let them know God has given me the ministry of reconciliation. Listen, I'm a bridge builder. I, I don't, don't try to make me be one that's build, building walls. No, a bridge builder. Bridge builder. And I know how to check people, too. Don't ever get that wrong. What Dr. Lee E. Cooper did in, at the state capitol the other day I, kudos to you, Dr. Cooper. And I'm not going to say I would have said the exact same thing, but if I could have said it just like that, I would have said it just like that. But it's a way to check people. Listen, y'all. You know, just because God's given us a message of reconciliation doesn't mean we can't open our mouth and call people on the carpet. But, but the message of reconciliation, that in Christ there is forgiveness of sin. That the one thing that the Bible says has separated us from God no longer is a factor. It has been dealt with on the cross. And reconciliation is about building bridges between imperfect people and a holy and a perfect God. And if, really, if we look back, and I'm almost done. If we look back at Lazarus, 
we see that at first, it's okay to still stink. God is not counting your stink against you. Uh, additionally, we need not be afraid of the stink of others. And, and then we have this amazing statement in verse number 20. We are ambassadors for Christ. God chose you and me as a Christian to share this message. Paul, he said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, he said, but we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. God has deposited in you and I as believers the knowledge uh, in, in the brilliant and noble and powerful minds of our culture. He's, uh, he's, he put it in you. He didn't put it in all of the, of the brilliant uh, people's minds. He put it in our minds. Uh, he's placed it in jars of clay, ordinary earth vessels. You know what it's symbolic of? The ordinary folks, uh, the weak, the foolish, the inadequate human beings that we are. But why has God put something so important into you and I, Reverend? Why has he done it? Why has he put something so important in something so very fragile, uh, easily broken vessels? He tells us why. He says to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. And this transcendent power, it unites us. It, it gathers us. It really harmonizes us. It breaks down the, the wall of partition. It removes the barriers. It does not make superficial uh, external adjustments in our life, but it works uh, from within and it produces permanent transformations. Your life shouldn't be the same way it was before you came to Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, there's no other power like that that can do that. It's absolutely unrivaled. And God, he gives it to us and tells us to go and tell it and share it to this lost and dying world. But in closing, what does God want us to, to go and share with this lost and dying world? He wants us to go and share the gospel and the core, the core message of the gospel is a fresh start that sinners who have deliberately rebelled against God, they have been offered a new beginning purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. But the message of the gospel is one not just of fresh start, a fresh start, but one of fresh starts, plural. No matter how many times we stumble, no matter how many times we rebel, no matter how many times we make the selfish choice to do what we want to do, my God, he gives us a fresh start. His mercies really are new every morning. Deacon Park, I love how you talk about midnight. <laughs> when, the, when, the, when the clock hits midnight... We were almost a goner, but when the clock struck midnight, then we have new mercy. We serve a God of forgiveness. We serve a God of patience. Uh, church, we serve a God of grace. And our Lord, he stoops down every time we mess up. He stoops down again and again. I don't know about you, but I would be tired of stooping down and picking somebody up. But our God, he stoops down and picks us up. Not because we are deserving, but because he is so loving. And if he were not, there would not be any hope for any of us. I don't know about you this morning. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you've done. But I know this for sure. You can have a new start, but there's an enemy who would want you to believe that you are always going to be stuck in your situation and there's no hope for you. But Jesus' blood, it's that's been spilled out, it cries from the ground. You can turn, you can turn, and you can have a new start he will come to you the first time the second time the third time 
the fourth time, no matter how long it takes, our God will come. The door of the church is open. I'm going to ask that those who will be baptized, if they will prepare themselves in the back, and I'm going to ask the Reverend Keith Boyce, he would come and lead us during our altar our time of coming forward. If you desire a church home, if you desire prayer, if you desire to be baptized, then you can come. While the blood is running warm in your veins, you can come to Jesus. You can come weary. You can come wounded. You can come sad. And you can find in him a resting place. And he will make you glad. The door of the church is open. The opportunity is now extended. You can come as a Christian wanting to be a member of this church, you can come and sit yourself right in one of these white chairs. If you desire to rededicate your life back to the Lord, back to this local church, if you've been out of fellowship, you can come as well. But maybe uh, you desire to be baptized, uh, you can come as well. Uh, you can come now. Why don't you stand? Why don't you stand? Hallelujah. Is there one? Anybody ever just want to surrender everything? Sometimes you just get tired. Anybody ever just got tired of doing something? But I know one thing you will change when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. You'll change. Help me sing this. I surrender all. I surrender. Come on, help me sing. I, I surrender all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I Hold it open. One more time, sing. I surrender all. I surrender. God is waiting on you. And if you ever want to be the member of a church that will accept you just the way you are, this is the place. Hey, hey, oh. One last time. Say all to thee. All to thee, my blessed Savior. Oh, I surrender all. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody give God some praise right now. Oh, you know, heaven is rejoicing right now. Oh, I surrender. Oh, 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 oh,
Praise the Lord. Just coming down for prayer. Come on, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you right now in the name of Jesus for everything you've done. God, we thank you for these people that have came down for prayer. God, we don't know why they have came down for prayer, but God, you know. And God, we know that you know everything that's going on in the body. So God, in the name of Jesus, we just pray right now that everything that is wrong, God, you make it right, God. We pray you make every crooked path straight in the name of Jesus. God, we pray that you heal bodies from the sole of the head, the top of the head to the sole of your feet, God. God, we pray that you mend attitudes. And, and, and God, we pray that you build bridges where bridges were out, God. In the name of Jesus right now, God. And we'll be so careful to give your name all the honor, glory, and all the praise that is only due unto you. And every heart said amen. Now come on and give God some praise. Listen, you know why? You know why? I say put your hands together every time we do something because when you clap, it confuses the enemy. So somebody put your hands together and put a praise on it. Can somebody put a praise on it? Hallelujah. You got to be able to put a praise on it. Whatever you're going through in life, let me tell you this. I was sitting in my, in my new house, hallelujah, with no furniture in my house. But every now and then, I just started dancing around my, around my living room. And now I got a sofa, love seat, a dining room set that I can seat six. Somebody want to come over and eat? I got you. I got you. Hallelujah. But that's because I put a praise on it. Can somebody tell me? Can somebody, can somebody promise me this week that you're going to put a praise on it? I can't hear nobody over here. Can somebody promise me you're going to put a praise on it? When the devil got you backed up against the wall, you're just going to put a praise on it. You're just going to start praising God. You're just going to start moving your feet and dancing all around your house. That's what you got to do. Some of us, we don't shout no more. We don't shout no more. And you ain't got to have no special kind of feeling to shout. The Bible says, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, I can put a praise. Y'all ain't ready. I can put a praise on it. Hallelujah. Listen, listen, I'm going to turn over to pastor. When I ain't got no money, I put a praise on it. I put a praise on it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Wait a minute, hold on, hold on. One last thing, one last thing. Listen, and all y'all can relate to this. When people are getting on my last nerve, Everybody should have been shouting right then. Everybody should have been shouting right then. Hallelujah. Glory to God. At this time, come on, somebody say glory. At this time, we're going to turn it over to our the hands of our pastor, Dr. Derek Scobie. Let's say amen as he comes. Amen. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He's worthy to be praised. There are two ordinances of the church. One is the communion of the Lord's Supper, which we will do immediately following this one. And the second, which really I would say the first, is water baptism. Here at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, we hold to uh, complete immersion, uh, not just a sprinkling. Uh, we do not believe that you must be baptized in order to be saved. We simply believe that, out, that baptism is an outward expression for your inward conviction. What your conviction is about Jesus Christ, of who he is in your own personal life. And if you are truly a believer, 
then we are to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in believers baptism and I'm going to um, I'm going to ask that sister Mardell uh, Hawkins that she would come and she is certainly very emotional at this time and I understand uh, why amen Sister Mardell is really, um, I say, my God sister. Her mother, who's gone home to be with the Lord, Esther Jean McCormick, all the way from Bowley, Oklahoma. Uh, she was my daddy's dear friend, and she was my dear friend. And this is her daughter, one of the twins. And before I baptize her, I am going to ask, I'm going to ask that first her husband, where he is, that he would stand. Amen. Amen. Then I'm going to ask her daughter to stand. Look, I was going to say little sister Samara. She's not little no more. She used to be in, riding with us all over the country. And then, is that, is that Wardell? Amen. Her twin. Amen. Amen. And then I'm going to ask her brother, Brent King, to stand. Amen. And then all of her Sister in law Angela, she would stand, but then all of her, her other family and friends who have come, and family and friends who are here at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, your, your friend of Sister Mardell, if you'll stand. Amen. Sister Mardell, is it your story that you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? Well, upon the divine will of God, upon the profession of your own faith, I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, bear with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen. Our next candidate is coming down. Amen. I know I've got religion. I know I've got religion. Because I've been bad time. Amen. Before I ask her family um, to stand, specifically her mother and others, I, I do. I was just told that a friend of mine, who is a friend of hers, uh, is is here. Uh, Brother Meldon, where are you? If you'll stand where you are. Stand, Brother Meldon. Amen. Brother Meldon is the brother-in-law to uh, Dr. Earl Bryan at the Wildwood Baptist Church. But I want to say this publicly: we never know how someone impacts our life. Um, in 1991, 92, I, I was at really a low point in life, and Meldon was just my, he's still my friend, but he was my friend, and we would hang together, and he would make me laugh, 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 and he helped me through a very tough time in life. Thank you. Amen. I'm going to ask Sister Corrine if she would come down and going to ask if her mother would stand. Amen. And then I believe other family members, if you would stand, family, and then all friends. Amen. You may be seated. We're grateful that you came to support us. Sister Corrine, is it your story that you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? Amen. Upon the divine will of God and upon the profession of your own faith, we now baptize you, our sister, in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the midst of life. Take me to the water. Take me Amen. To the water. That now concludes our baptismal service. We are going to move into the communion of the Lord's Supper. 
here at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, we hold to an open communion, simply meaning that if you are a born again, baptized believer, then you can share with us in the communion of the Lord's Supper. Amen. If you choose not to, and if you want to remove yourself at this time, it would certainly be a good time to excuse yourself. But we would ask that those who are going to be here, that we would refrain from unnecessary uh, walking and talking here in a few moments. But as I make my way back down to the pulpit, I would ask that you would just spend a few minutes and asking the Lord to search you, search your heart, your mind, and ask the Lord to remove anything from within you that ought, that ought not to be within you as we prepare uh, to commemorate the Lord's Supper. Amen. the life that has come over the last year. Amen. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm from California, and I, I came out here. I moved my family out here, and at the time, I had a, my fiance, we was pregnant. We had a baby on the way, and we came out here in 2019, um, and we thought, you know, we had our own plans about why we need to be in Oklahoma and moving way out here. Um, those things didn't fall through, you know, and we found ourselves in a situation where we didn't know where we was going to go. We didn't have any friends. We didn't know anybody out here. Um, but I knew Ebenezer and I knew Pastor Scobie. So when I was at my lowest point, that's who I reached out to. And I attached, my, I attached myself to this church, um, to the mission, um, to the pastor's mission. And since that time, man, my life is just, our life has been completely different. Um, just, you know, I was the person, I didn't like church. I didn't believe in church. I didn't like pastors. I didn't believe in pastors. <laughs> um, um, and, and so I always had my ideas about, you know, so many churches and not really doing anything in the community. And so coming here, I had the opportunity to understand what it is to be a servant, understand what it is to be a blessing to others, and that's how you really get your blessings. 
And so for me, you know, we've come from, you know, living on her mother's floor, you know, to having our own place, to now owning a farm and having our own business. Um, and her family has been watching us grow. And just recently, uh, we just came back from Las Vegas. A day later, her brother followed us out here and moved into the house next door to us. Um, and so he, he, he sees what's been doing. He sees what's been going. He's been seeing what, you know, how God has been blessing us and our family. And he wants the same thing. And so he'll be here. And so again, I thank Pastor. I thank, I thank you, First Lady, for all of the support and all the love that this church, Cam, all the members have been given to us and our family. We've grown here. My babies have been raised now in this church. Um, they've been born here in this church. We were baptized in this church together. So we're extremely blessed. And I thank you and I love all of you. Amen. Thank you, Brother Allery. Allow me to read just a few uh, verses of scripture and then I'm going to ask that uh, Deacon Ransom would lead us in prayer. Uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse 23. For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, uh, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new, test, new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. while we sing. Amen. Oh, oh, oh it reaches to the highest mountain. After the Last Supper that Jesus and his disciples, they sang a hymn. And they went out into the Mount of Olives. And there Jesus, he was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. He was arrested. He was taken before Pontius Pilate, before Caiaphas, the high priest, from Judgment Hall to Judgment Hall. 
they marched our Savior up, up a hill called Calvary where they hung him high, they stretched him wide. Someone asked the question, why, what evil has he done? They hit him over the head with a crown of thorns. They plucked out his beard. They spat upon him. They pierced him in the side after they nailed nails in his hands and nails in his feet. But as they hung him high and stretched him wide, the Bible lets us know that he gave up the ghost. He died. He surely died. But that's not the end of the story because they took him down off of that cross and they buried him in Joseph of Arimathea's bar tomb. And that's not the end of the story. The Bible lets us know that three days later he rose with all power in heaven and in earth. And I'm so very grateful that he was raised to life for our justification. As we uh, prepare to dismiss, we will not have uh, a closing uh, prayer and benediction uh, today. We will simply uh, fellowship our way out the door as I'm going to ask that my wife and daughter, we're going to go outside under the portico and certainly greet you there. But we would just ask that we would all fellowship out as we sing, oh, what a fellowship. Amen. Leaning 